Welcome to Scouting for Growth. Today, I am meeting with Sam Evans, partner at EOS Venture Partners, a strategic venture capital fund and an insurtech investment specialist with offices in London and Philadelphia. I met with Sam at the launch of the podcast, and that was episode six. And today we decided to dive into the sustainability and ESG topic. So please listen to this interview to get to know about EOS, EOS tragic lands on ESG2. We will talk about the impact of urbanization, climate risk, and supply chain risk. We'll talk about business models, and we'll also share with you what insurtechs are doing in these specific areas. So let's get started. Welcome to Scouting for Growth. Today, I am meeting with Sam Evans. Sam is a partner at EOS Venture Partners, a strategic venture capital fund and an insurtech investment specialist with offices in London and Philadelphia. You all met Sam in episode two, actually, of Scouting for Growth, when we talked a little bit about sustainability already, but focused on Sam and EOS a little bit more. So for those who have not listened to this podcast yet, well, I met Sam many years back and uh, we, I mean, Sam helped me actually with my accelerators uh, many years ago. And since we have helped many startups either get funding or um, learn to work within our insurtech landscape. So thank, thank you, Sam, for being with me again today. Yeah, hi Sabine, thank you for the invitation. Today, we want to address the world of sustainability and ESG. So we will talk about the impact of urbanization, climate risk, and supply chain risk. So let's get started. So a few bits of definition. ESG stands for environmental. This criterion looks at the impact of resource conception from business on the environment, like carbon footprint, waste, water discharges, among other environmental impact. Social relates to criteria looking at how a business interacts with its local communities that include internal policy related to labor, diversity, equity and inclusion policies, and the day of governance related to internal practices and policies that lead to the effect of decision-making from leaders and legal compliance as well. ESG facilitate top line growth if it is run and delivered in the right way. So over the past few months, Sam and I have actually evaluated a number of tech startups actually that are starting to enter the insurtech space and solving for ESG principles. So Sam, what's your view of ESG? And what is your definition of ESG within our sustainable or sustainability change, which we are seeing more and more companies taking advantage of today? Yeah, thanks, Sabine. So, yeah, I mean, if you take a step back, um, yeah, I think as a global economy, yeah, we're, we're facing a number of really quite pivotal challenges. Um, you've obviously got you know, some, some major um, you know, weather related events linked to climate change and how that's flowing through to natural catastrophes. Um, you know, we're obviously insurance has a key role to play, um, but at the same time, we're seeing you know significant uh, change in terms of population dynamics uh, with you know, many parts of the world uh, aging populations and creating the right infrastructures to support um, those parts of the, um, of the ecosystem. And then similarly, you know, uh, urbanisation uh, with you know, significant. Um, proportion of the population moving in, into cities with all the challenges that that, that creates. So, you know, fundamentally, um, we think insurance has, has, a, has a, a key role to play in supporting these, you know, major macro shifts and changes. Uh, but actually, when you when you break it down, you know, insurtech could really be the driving force for the insurance industry and in actually tackling some of these ESG agendas, uh, because a lot of the solutions you know, a sort of relying on either a technology play or a better use of data or accessing different data sources, you know, to, to, to sort of, you know, come at the problem from a different perspective. Um, so ultimately, you know, we really sort of see in tech 
as, as playing a, a fundamental role in, in taking the industry forward. And, you know, it, it's fair to say insurance has done some good things, I think, around the ESG agenda, but there's so much more potential. There's so much more scope. You know, we could and should be doing a lot more. So, yeah, we're, we're highly motivated to support from an insure tech perspective um, and actually to link it back to our fund. Um, we have a, a, a target of having a positive impact on 500 million lives through the underlying portfolio companies um, by sort of incorporating ESG related aspects you know, into our investment decisions. So that's everything from you know, helping to close the protection gap, um, looking at you know, supply chain issues, which we'll come to talk to, um, as well as quality of care, access of care, and all those associated issues. So yeah, looking forward to diving into that in, in more detail. Thank you, Sam. So let's look at urbanization. Actually, you already um, touched on this on this issue. To give everyone a little bit of an intro, urbanization refers to moving population growth from rural towns to metropolitan areas, allowing city and towns to grow. This is also called progressive increase of population living in towns to urban areas. The concept alters city lives village economic, social mileage, social economic privileges as well. Today, 56% of the world population now lives in cities. The biggest change actually has been in Latin America and in the Caribbean with 81 to 82% of the population in urban areas up from 41% since I would say the 1950s. By 2030, at least 61% of urban populations will be living in cities. Two billion people in the world will actually live in slums. So what does it mean for you, Sam, around some of the things we need to consider when we start looking at urbanization and urban risk? Yeah, so so for us, and obviously there's there's, many, many aspects to this, so we're really applying a you know, insure tech lens uh, and where, you know, we think insure tech can, can, can play a role in helping to facilitate that you know, major, major shift and transformation in, in a lot of economies. Um, just a few areas just, just to, 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 to highlight. Um, obviously, quality of, and access to healthcare is going to be critical um, you know, as, as we face growing populations and actually also as well links to um, the aging issue that I mentioned uh, earlier on. Um, here we're looking at you know, the ability to leverage um, different ways of thinking about insurance um, and making it less about a pure protection driven product, but actually transitioning more into a prevention type focus. So that's engaging with people earlier in different ways um, to help them live longer and healthier lives. Um, if in one sense that sort of adds to the challenge, um, but you know, clearly there's a lot that can be done to make healthcare more affordable, easier to access, but also a lot more efficient. Uh, at the moment, you know, there's so much sort of inefficiencies in the system because everything is done on a, you know, a sort of generic basis rather than being tailored uh, to the individual. And actually, uh, and this applies, I think, to a lot of these areas, but insurance is the natural infrastructure, if you like, to plug these things together because from an insurance perspective, it's also about cost efficiency. And if we can drive better efficiency through the system, obviously they pay less claims. It's in everyone's interest. It lowers the premiums, um, you have greater coverage. So um, looking at areas around life sciences and health tech, um, which links to things like wellness, nutrition, sleep, activity, and embedding those within an insurance infrastructure to provide people with the right access uh, to, to care, but also tailored to them as an individual. So that it's a lot more efficient in terms of usage of drugs and um, you know, when and uh, how best to uh, tackle, you know, um, diseases within the body, et cetera. Um, I think, you know, we can see the, the combination of insurance and health tech slash life sciences, you know, as, as playing a, a key role uh, in that perspective. Um, other interesting areas, obviously, as we move, you know, to a more urban-based economy, the ways of working change significantly. We'll see a lot more, I think, you know, gig economy based uh, workers. Um, what we're seeing already at the moment is that traditional insurance solutions are just not fit for purpose uh, because they're generic. Again, you know, they're not usage based. They don't align 
with the underlying behaviors uh, of the policyholder. Um, so when I talked about closing the protection gap, uh, sort of obviously there's a you know immediate thought goes to the developing markets, but there is a, you know a huge uh, need within the more mature economies um, where. You know, taking the US as an example, I think you know, close to 50% of the population score you know, badly from a credit risk perspective and they're therefore penalised uh, through the cost of their insurance. Um, so the ability to tailor have, you know, usage-based coverage that switches seamlessly between personal and commercial usage. For example, if you're you know, using your vehicle for a, a rideshare uh, scheme, you know, becomes very, very relevant for, for individuals. So, uh, making again insurance more affordable, so that you know it, it goes right through um, through the population, and particularly the people with more need who are currently struggling. Um, given that there's just you know inherent inbuilt biases within the system that um, penalises them, when again it's not necessarily a true reflection of the underlying risk. So that sort of protection gap linked to new ways of working, new ways of behaving. I think uh, in short term will be a key driver. Um, and maybe one final comment, um, which again is sort of uh, another adjacent part to that piece is probably moving into different types of ownership models. So a lot more car, you know, around car sharing, uh, we'll need to leverage, you know, electric vehicles, um, at some point in the future, autonomous vehicles. Um, so um, yeah, you know, again, traditional insurance solutions are just not fit for purpose. Uh, for those types of models so we need to think about how best just to structure insurance to write, provide the right level of coverage at affordable rates and embedded typically you know embedded within the underlying platforms that are enabling the, uh, the you know the new usage uh, models so in short it naturally um, I think aligns um, with those uh, types of um, changes and actually I'll throw one more into the mix because I think energy usage and efficiency Again, it's going to become a lot more important. You know, we have to be much more um, focused and smart around how we're using resources. And again, technology can play a key role, even if you look at it simply from a you know a home perspective and energy usage, uh, and using IoT and sensors and you know smart AI to, to you know improve behaviours and enhance efficiency, lower energy usage. Um, even looking at you know to the extent we can move to more. You know, circular based business models that again are, you know, sort of have that um, drive around reusability um, and uh, yeah, just cutting down on, on waste because you know, clearly we're living currently in a really un in an unsustainable uh, way which we have to address if we're going to be uh, you know, smarter going forward. So it's interesting because you actually highlighted quite a few opportunities, right, for insurers. Health, you know, health and health hazard provide opportunity to do something better. Partly, you know, for people who are healthy or could continue to be healthy, but people who are probably needs a little bit of advice on health. Uh, I would say I would include as well in, in there um, the consideration around health and homelessness because actually you also need usually we think about people who can afford but then you also touch upon financial resilience and affordability so another peak area i think when you start looking at urbanization you look at health hazard you look at homelessness and then we we look at how we can use technology to better serve ourselves we mentioned health tech H tech as well for the elderly, but also electric vehicles, which for me goes into how can we get better around air pollution reduction, waste management, uh, but also water, right? Water pollution. So when you look at some of the concept around electric vehicle and using technology to enable us to do things a bit better, that is where I can see potentially some opportunity, of, you know, touching on some of the major challenges we have to deal with in cities. What's your view around deforestation? Um, how are insurers dealing with deforestation? You know, when we build homes in cities, we're actually taking the trees away. And I've seen a number of organizations looking at deforestation or reforestation as an opportunity as well for innovation. Have you seen some of this as well happen with your um, LPs or the insurers um, you're working with, Sam? 
Yeah, of course, it's it's certainly a major major area of focus. Um, and interestingly, maybe just to to draw something that's maybe a little bit uh, new. So obviously, you know, in short, it's always looking at product innovation and um, how to serve parts of the market that are currently you know, lacking in coverage. And uh, we made a business recently that are looking to provide insurance for the voluntary carbon markets. So where obviously you know, large organizations are buying um, carbon credits, which are linked to, or often linked to, you know, reforestation and, um, you know, all those good, good activities. Um, there's no, there's currently no insurance market for uh, those credits. So if something happens to the underlying, you know, plantation, uh, then how, how can that be addressed and how can we again create more um, protection and sustainability within the, the cycle? So, yeah, there's always these, you know, new business models looking to come into the market where there's a gap um, and look at innovative solutions to provide coverage. So I thought that was quite, um, quite an interesting business model. So you also mentioned a few business model already, which I, I want to highlight. So you mentioned usage base. So um, a lot of the innovation which is coming right now to deal with the urbanization risk, uh, look at usage based insurance so as a service. You mentioned embedded. You mentioned also a circular economy. And I think I can see part, potentially parametric models as well playing very well in this type of environments. What are for you the potential challenges insurers need, are going to face in looking to implement some of those new business models, Sam? I think I don't know that necessarily specific to the ESG agenda. I think there are probably the similar challenges around just the economy is moving so rapidly um, and you know if, when you break down sort of the traditional insurance products you know they fundamentally haven't changed for you know 100 plus years you can maybe even say 300 years in in some uh, some instances so um, they're always not always but they're typically you know static historical looking uh, solutions um, they're very reliant on very detailed modeling that's been built up based on you know, historical patterns. Um, but of course, what we're seeing now is because th things are moving so rapidly, um, you know, cl climate models from 10 years ago are, are almost certainly out of date. So um, the insurers need to transition to a much more real-time assessment of risk, and it needs to be linked more specifically to behavioral characteristics rather than proxy static factors built on these historical models and making that transition is obviously it's incredibly difficult for insurers to to make that shift because it's turning their business model almost upside down and it's not something you can do overnight with a huge organization so that um whilst it's, this is a bad analogy for an esg conversation but the oil tanker analogy is a good fit it takes a long time to turn the ship um so i think i think those are probably the main the main challenges and then i guess you know being able to move in an agile flexible way because you need to gonna be popping up you know as, as the economies make this transition um so being flexible enough to actually adapt your business model and product solution and distribution models to fit those needs again i think um, will, will be key Absolutely. And I realize for sure for the business model, they are probably universal is a shift from A to B and it's not easy for large enterprises. So let's look now probably at something which is but closer to the heart of a lot of insurers out there, which is climate change and probably the initiative that everybody is talking about right now in terms of ESG. So a little bit of an introduction around climate change. The average global temperature has risen by 1.1 degree centigrade, oh, sorry, Celsius, uh, since the 18th uh, century. It continues to increase. Don't underestimate this seemingly small figure because it's actually uh, massive. This little increase has a massive impact on society, on climate itself. I don't know whether you saw a few days ago. Actually, Sam, it wasn't snowing 
in London. And I understand it's snowing in Zurich whilst it was snowing as well in Tokyo when I was talking to one of my Japanese partners. So um, it's snowing when we are, it's not supposed to snow. And I think we had also a wonderful sun a few days ago, 19 degrees as well. So we had two or three seasons in just one week. So we have seen months of rains and we have seen snow, we have seen sun, and, and this is affecting us all. And also droughts and in, in Africa, for instance. So it sounds terrifying, I think. At the human level, it is catastrophic, not least because climate change doesn't impact everyone equally. The hardest hit are often the people in a poorest country, as we all know. And so we, we need to find best way to cope with it. So when we were doing some research, actually, uh, Sam, around climate risk and climate tech, we found out that over 500 billion have already been invested in climate tech companies. They are not just in they are not just in sure tech. A lot of those companies are outside our industry, from solar energy to what you mentioned earlier, electric vehicle and autonomous autonomous driving, um, wind wind energy, food tech, crop tech, to name but a few, and fashion tech, which I'm passionate about. So, what do you think are the things we can learn? right now to be more effective when we start looking at climate change and climate risk? Yeah, clearly it's, it's a massive area, isn't it? And um, I, I spent many years living in Australia and just you know, looking back over the last 12 months there where they, they've suffered you know, horrendous wildfires and then within several months they're facing you know, 100 year uh, event floods um, in, the same, um, you know, in, in the same location. So you're almost seeing you know, the, the extremes of weather, and it's occurring a lot more frequently. Um, and clearly, as you said, you know, having a, a you know, devastating impact on, on economies and, and individuals. Um, so for us, yeah, this is, a, this is a very interesting area. And again, it, it's a natural fit for insurtechs because a lot of it's driven by new modeling techniques, new data. Um, so maybe just a couple of, couple of ideas and things that are certainly interesting for our, our perspective. And I should say, obviously, as well, you know, Responding to natural catastrophes is an area where the insurance industry as a whole, you know, is already doing a huge amount of work, and there's a lot of initiatives to try and reduce the protection gap. Um, but clearly, you know, I forget the exact numbers, but it's still a huge, a huge proportion of, particularly those, you know, very vulnerable economies and populations that are lacking insurance. So, fundamentally, coming back down to closing that protection gap is going to be uh, important, but. Um, from an insure tech perspective, some of the things we're seeing is um, use of different data sets, as I mentioned. So geospatial imagery um, is, a, is a good example. So there's now a lot of you know, satellite imagery available. Um, there's a few different uh, techniques that we've, um, that we've seen. Um, but yeah, the ability to have a much granular you know, view and understanding of how weather patterns are changing and the impact that has on flood and other sort of related risks, um, wildfires, um, you know, degradation to the landscape, and all those types of issues. You know, a lot of that information can now be uh, assessed from satellites, um, even you know, quality of, of crops, um, identifying issues. So, um, yeah, quite quite a fundamental you know, adv advance, I think, really in our capability. So, leveraging that data and then linking it through to insurance coverage and solutions, I think, is, is certainly an area of interest. Um, you mentioned parametric uh, earlier. Again, that's a nice fit, I think, you know, for, for these um, for these types of issues. So there's obviously quite a, quite a few now uh, focusing on this on this space. But I guess you know, an obvious example is around you know, agricultural markets in developing markets where you know you can almost instantly respond to either adverse weather events or issues in the supply chain. Maybe we can come, come to talk to you in a second. Um, but yeah, where there's a crop failure for whatever reason, you know, you can have automatic payouts that are linked to those trigger events so that, you know, money is being uh, delivered to the people in need at you know, optimum time. You're not reliant on you know, a three month long process that requires someone to, you know, a crop assessor to do a physical um, assessment of the property. You know, as I said, it could be done using satellite imagery. So, yeah, that new data parametric triggers, I think, really interesting. Um, 
other applications as well are looking at you know next generation modeling um so as i said earlier you know, using historical climate models you know is, is is challenging given the pace of change and how quickly you know the the, the world is um moving on that on those types of issues so there are several businesses that we've met recently that are looking at how they can you know, leverage cutting edge modeling techniques to provide much more granular much more accurate you know view of risk um which leads on to then another interesting area which is thinking about you know active risk management resilience and you know, if we understand how things are likely to develop then we can be much you know smarter in terms of preparation and even advanced warnings of, of you know, severe weather events and seeing what can be done in advance to reduce the severity of the impact when those types of things uh, things things land um, that extends through you know, from a reinsurance perspective looking at risk accumulation again you can look at uh, that on a, on a sort of global basis and you know where we've, where we've had big events in the past people haven't really understood i don't think you know the accumulation of risk that, that exists um, but now the data is available to start looking at that again in real time so that you can either put in place additional uh, protection or take take measures to then reduce severity in the event that you know adverse um, weather events or equivalent are you know are expected so it's interesting because a lot of the innovation i think is uh, which is coming seems to be focusing on physical risk right the physical building or you know an asset which which we can touch and feel but there is also an other part of um of what is happening with climate which actually links to liability risk like people risk right being you know workers rates fast fatality which we also need to pay attention to there is a third area of risk which is a balance between the two which is called transition risk which is literally i think addressing the fact that business models are moving, right? Think about BP, Total, they actually have to move their business model from dealing with renewable energy, from a sort of fossil fuel energy to actually moving to renewable energy. And that affects you know, the complete business model, right? And to the way they do business and also the solution and capability they use to actually continue to be uh, profitable entities what are your views as to how insurers and the corporate the support are dealing together you know in addressing the the climate the climate risk i think honestly i think we're still um we're still at the early days of what's of what's possible a lot of the things that we see are quite disparate fragmented um i think you know the in, the industry i guess it, you know obviously we've we've had uh, other challenges to, to manage over the last you know 24 months 18 months 24 months it's not it's not been the easiest time has it but um i think you know the 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 the, the will is there to to make this happen and there are obviously some great organizations that are helping to facilitate and, and you know pull together you know, blue marble is a good example we work we work with them um have kind of done at different times so the infrastructure is being created i think the commitment is there the drive is there um but just yeah just lacking something to sort of pull it all together um to really make a you know much more meaningful impact because yeah, there's different obviously ways of you know coming to look at you know in where industries are right, in terms of their performance from an ESG perspective, financial services typically falls, you know, towards the back of the pack. Um, and you know, given the, the, our positioning, I think we should really be thinking about how we can move to, to the front and take a you know a leading role. Yeah, no, interesting. Still a lot to to be done. Uh, often, I often think, how can uh, you know the organisation we're working with? work more closely and understand the challenges faced by, you know, the, the large corporates who have to go through that change themselves. So therefore have to make choices which need to be insured that will require insurance in the future, sometimes unknown, uh, which mean that, you know, the insurers who participate are involved in some of those initiatives earlier on than late actually goes through uh, understanding the transformation. A lot of industry are going on, are going to, to have to deal with right now. 
Yeah, exactly. And you know, when you think about insurance, it touches every single part of the economy. Um, so it's a natural enabler for, for driving these initiatives. So I just would like to jump into now supply chain to actually close the cycle. So supply chain management was once a logistical process confined to the job description of a few. Now supply chain management is far more prominent. Indeed, all customers are aware of supply chain problems. We have experienced that all during the course of the past 24 months in ways that we have never seen before. And supply chains have become a hot geopolitical and social topic and an economic one as well. It is increasingly worth the it is increasingly worthy of our attention as an emerging risk. As McKinsey says, the world is getting riskier. Today, supply chains are inherently more complex, facing significant challenges. Indeed, it is impossible to argue that many specific risks feed into supply chain risk as a melting pot where hazard become a reality. So when you look at what we face today and what we've experienced actually, Sam, over the course of the past few months, what do you see as our supply chain risk here in Europe and what are our opportunities? Yeah, again, um, obviously it's a very, very topical issue. Um, yeah, and if the COVID pandemic has again had a, you know, a massive impact and whereas if you go back a few years, you know, I guess, a, a lot of the motivations around supply chains were all driven by cost um, and you know, getting the most cost effect effective uh, model, you know, leveraging global infrastructure. Um, I think there is definitely a shift now to also, you know, getting a balance between cost and reliability and certainty, um, particularly given the, you know, the, the macroeconomic environment and political environment, um, which is just adding, adding to the challenges. So, uh, economies are going to want to have greater control of their supply chains and you know resource needs and all those associated issues. So um, certainly, you know, it's yeah, uh, you know, a very volatile uh, time. Um, again, just taking a very narrow sort of insurtech lens uh, to it, there are already you know a number of um, you know businesses that are working, focusing uh, on this part of the market. There's probably two lenses where we see um, maybe the most attention. Uh, the, the first is around actually understanding, um, as I mentioned it a little bit earlier, the risk accumulation issues associated with supply chains. Um, I think the Tianjin port fire is a, is a nice example, which ended up being a huge insurance loss. And a lot of it actually, obviously there was physical damage created through the um, event of the port, but I think the bigger loss actually came through all the business interruption claims um, when you sort of rec recognize that all the, uh, like the motor manufacturers, for example, and all the parts that were, um, you know, being kept at the port for, for shipping to overseas uh, markets um, just devastated a lot of the, you know, manufacturing supply chains. So, uh, again, it comes back to modeling and data and a better understanding of events and what that could mean uh, from a um, risk accumulation coverage to a total loss perspective. So, again, being much more um, you know, efficient, effective, smart around managing those risks, I think is interesting and InsureTech can play a key role. Um, and the other part is actually thinking about efficiency within the supply chain. So a lot of that links back to use of IoT. Um, so you know, there are businesses that are able to track the movement of goods from you know, warehouse um, all the way through, also factory all the way through to warehouse and then warehouse through to end uh, user um, and looking at, you know, well, why are we seeing, a, you know, a spike in, in in claims or issues with that particular part of the value chain or supply chain, and then you can actually go in and, and address that and find out what's what's going wrong at that particular point. Um, it, you know, um, managing temperature, for example, in containers for drug, a lot of there's a lot of damage or a lot of issues created by drugs um, being unusable because of temperature changes in. In, as they move through the supply chain. So, you know, IoT again provides you with real time data on, on those types of uh, metrics. So, again, you can be proactive in terms of how you're um, you know, looking to, um, to manage uh, potential inefficiencies within the supply chain. So, I think, yeah, InsureTech linked IoT, um, 
linked to supply chain is a is an interesting area and um actually one of our portfolio companies can steer us uh, do a lot of work uh, in that space and would certainly be a good good place to start if anyone is interested in uh, doing a, a deep dive yeah, I was talking to the to Andy uh, recently, um, and it's interesting because I know you already highlighted that within our climate change uh, section. But I think there are things we can also learn from climate into to supply chain. You know, there's geospatial data you mentioned. Now we are looking at geopolitical terrorist data potentially, right, um, to actually determine what may happen on the supply chain. Uh, we have seen as well, you mentioned the modeling. I think you are looking at flood modeling now. You're actually probably looking at ma marine, maritime modeling potentially here to see what is going to happen with ships on the sea. Uh, you, you can also look at maybe um, something we didn't mention in the previous section, digital twins, where you're actually able to replicate uh, a specific asset and see what may, and create some scenarios to see what may occur to that asset based on action or events taking place in other markets, in other countries. And then you, I think, again, the things you were mentioning earlier around the shift in business model, around the insurance as a service, the embedded, the parametrics also may come into play to start changing the way the product and services are being designed, I think, Sam. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. And it's one area we didn't haven't mentioned is that yeah, sort of risk management, safety component, which links to the digital twins. And again, there's a heavy IoT, um, you know, sort of link there. But you know, there's the ability to look, track, monitor activity, identify, you know, behaviours that are causing maybe injuries to employees, and fixing those issues within the sort of workplace. So, you know, ultimately, done in the right way. Yeah, insurance slash insure tech is enabling you know, more more affordable cover um, and also the ability to reach parts of the market which are currently underinsured or lacking insurance coverage but uh, you know i think as valuable is then making that transition away from being purely about you know a, a protection-based solution something bad has happened here's some you know, here's some cash to sort of cover that loss but actually to think about prevention, prediction, using the data more you know, in a smarter way to actually get ahead of some of these issues. So you're reducing both your frequency and severity of incidents yeah. and that links through to everything. And it, you know, it's creating safe environments for people. Um, and it links back to healthier lifestyles and all those you know, associated aspects. So, you know, when you take a step back, it's, it's, as I said earlier, you know, this, there's so much that can be done by just thinking about those three or four key aspects and you know, putting that together into a more integrated solution um, to cover particularly those you know, underserved, more vulnerable parts of the economy. Yeah. So I think for our listener, it's very important. We, we talk about urbanization, so urban risk. We talked about climate uh, change and climate risk. We talk about the supply chains of, of the world and then supply chain risk. When you look at those three areas, you need to think about them like a mat matrix where you have the environment, the social and the governance applying against each one of those different risk types. And so therefore different strategies will be deployed uh, with regards to how any organization is addressing the E, environmental issues, the S, social and with social innovation, people, diversity, uh, financial resilience, and as uh, Sam mentioned earlier, health is very key as well as part of this bucket. And then the policies and the way, the structure and, and the governance as to how we do this, that applies against each one of those different risk types. So what are the additional strategy or tactics could you give first to the startups which are there, the insurtech, the insurtechs which may actually look for founding from you, from a sustainable viewpoint, Sam? you are going to make a lot of investment and you have a very clear investment thesis looking at sustainability. So how can you help the insurtechs or the tech ventures to be more ready? Second part of the question would be, what would you say to our insurance partners, the insurers, LPs, uh, who are working with you as well around how they get to start embracing some of those changes, particularly those who have not started yet? Um, yeah, no, sure. Two two good questions. Um, I think on the on the first one on the insure techs, um, as I said earlier, you know, we have a 
um, that objective of trying to have a positive impact on 500 million lives um, through the underlying portfolio companies. And as, as a more general uh, observation, you know, purpose-led businesses tend to be more successful across all, you know, however you like look to measure those uh, from a you know, revenue, profitability, uh, valuation perspective. So I think being very clear um, around, you know, how ESG is, is embedded into your business model um, and the impact that you can have and the scale of that impact um, certainly is helpful for investors like ourselves and sort of understanding the problem that you're looking to solve and how you're going about that um, you know, in the most effective and efficient way possible. Um, so I guess that's about the, you know, the messaging clarity of purpose and, and, and having a, you know, making sure that's integrated into the business model and the financial projections in a way that's hopefully easy, easy for investors to, to understand. Um, on the flip side of the coin, I think for the insurers, you know, obviously there's already a lot of great work being done. Um, but I guess in our uh, observations, a lot of that is built around the traditional, you know, mechanism that the industry has, which is great. Um, and there's, there's, you know, all for that continuing. Um, I guess we would encourage people to think a little bit outside of the box. And as I said, you know, truly believe that InsureTech can be the driving force for the industry around ESG. So thinking about how they can use and leverage some of these new business models to tackle some of these issues, I think would be, uh, would, you know, would be um, time well spent. Absolutely. Uh, highly, highly insightful, actually. And uh, another point, actually, you, you, you highlighted, which I would like to, to stress as well, is, you know, when we look at the InsurTech organizations, which are there, there are different stages of uh, evolution. And you have in your portfolio companies you've invested years ago who are doing fantastic work today, which didn't start as an EHG startup, but now in the past, I would say 24 months, I've actually gradually embedded an ESG angle to their strategy because every InsurTech have to become ESG compliant, right? So really understanding how that plays into the InsurTech um, value chain, but the InsurTech business will be very important. Partly, you know, in recruiting talent. I, I know that at the moment, recruiting people is very difficult. So having that clear purpose will be key for any business which out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, you know, that it's fierce at the moment now from a talent perspective. So again, uh, and I think, you know, this, this is probably true for many people, but working for organizations with a you know, a clear purpose and it's not just about making money, but actually, you know, contributing back to society is, is very appealing to a lot of people. So making that um, very clear is, is definitely a, a strong, uh, a strong um, area where some of our companies have done very well in terms of, you know, bringing on leading talent from a development and other perspective. Absolutely. So what would be your last word of wisdom for our audience and listeners, Sam? How do they get started? And what do you think should inspire them to actually embrace some of the new trends? Yeah, I think I, I sort of come back to my maybe original comments. Um, you know, I tr truly believe um, that in, in tech can play a, a huge role in tackling you know, these issues. Um, there is you know, significant capital to deploy. Obviously EOS is a small part of that, but certainly as I said, you know, as I've said, it, it's, it's integral to how we're looking at investments and embedding that into our investment strategy. So the capital is there, the opportunity is there. Um, you know, we know there's some great people out there with a huge amount of talent. So, you know, we certainly are highly motivated to bring those three things together and you know, make some real change to the world. You know, having started working on this topic for the past two years, it's it's fascinating to see some of the great things we can do. Even, you know, looking at the social innovation angle, which is, you know, about people at the end, employees, workers, but also talent coming out of school uh, and, you know, individual. And uh, you mentioned quite a few times we need to be more careful around understanding what the protection gap is about. Protection gap is about technology and, and also uh, product and services not meeting the needs of specific segment of the population, but it's also about building financial resilience for those who need it the most. So um, very wise word, Sam. If um, an insure check, an LP, whoever wants to talk to you, what should they do? 
Uh, yeah, please please reach out. We're we're always keen to to engage with um, multiple parts of the of the industry. Um, uh, there's through our website you can reach us. Um, but yeah, we'd, we'd we'd love to have a conversation with anyone interested in this area. Yeah, and also follow Sam on on LinkedIn on Twitter. We we do talk to each other as well through the social media. We uh, have been working on a couple of articles. So the urbanization article is out, and uh, we'll have uh, one on climate risk with uh, some recommendation from Sam uh, and quotes as well from Sam and one on supply chain risk. So please uh, take some time to, to look for those articles and you'll be able to find them for sure on LinkedIn. Thank you, Sam, for your time. Great. Thank you, Sabine. And let's continue the conversation. Looking forward to it. Bye. Bye-bye. If you like this podcast, subscribe now, share with your friends, and if you enjoyed it, please give it a five-star review. Also, if you want to cover any specific subject with me, contact me on Instagram under Sabine VDL Officials or LinkedIn under Sabine Van der Linden. Thank you.